and the reason I said what I did, <coughs> I want you to listen to these department reports as they try to sum up what you have seen, and some of you missed it, I want you to listen. Bob Hutchison, the state of California, as the head of the Cotton Division. Bob? Thank you, Ernie. And there's one thing that I, I have to say before I start. I have attended several NFO conventions, and never have I felt but one thing I have to say before I get started, and I have to say this now, I've attended several NFO conventions, and I have never felt the unity of farmers together to get this job done. Everyone here knows. Everyone here knows what our problem is. We all know the only problem that the farmer has today is the fact that he is not putting the price on his commodity based on his cost of production. That's the problem. Everyone here knows the solution to that problem is for farmers to organize and put the price on their commodity. And a few couple of years ago, a guy named Selhorse came up with a thing he called the situation. He said, when you know the problem and you know the solution, then all you got's a situation. And all you have to do then is do what you have to do to correct a situation. It seems, sounds a lot simpler that way. I'm proud to be a representative of the NFO Cotton Producers. A group of cotton producers joined together for one goal, contracts with a price that reflect cost of production plus a reasonable profit. The NFO Cotton Division started in 1969. Since that time, they have had both successes and failures. The successes and failures have resulted in the building of a sound, workable cotton program with documentation, pay systems, and procedures that can be expanded to the size, to the scope, needed to put this organization in a position of all cotton farmers to set a price on our commodity at a cost plus a profit. The cotton division, we have negotiated for cotton and made sales on cotton in every major cotton producing area in the United States, in every state that produces cotton. Why do we have to do this? We have to do this because farmers, cotton farmers, over 300,000 of them spend over $3 billion just in the cost of producing the crop alone in the United States each year. And they got to pay the money back in most cases. And we have to do it because nobody is going to do it for us. We were told as cotton farmers at the first of 1977 that all we had to do was plant the crop and the price would be automatic. We were told in every farm publication that came out and across the cotton belt that we would have less cotton on hand in the United States than we have had in 25 years. That was true. We were told that we would have less than a four-month supply in the world as of August the 1st, the fiscal year on cotton. That was true. Then along came March. And all planting intentions were out. Farmers had most a lot of cotton already planted and were in the process of planting the cotton. And from that point down, we have lost a price of 20 cents a pound from 70 cents down to 50 cents a pound, the difference between a cost plus a profit and a loss. And still, those same facts are true. Is that supply and demand? We still have less cotton on hand in the world than a four-month supply. So we know supply and demand doesn't work. The only thing that works is farmers joining together to put a price on their commodity. And we cannot ask anyone else to do it for us. And the only way it'll be done is by us doing it ourselves, blocking our commodity together, and using the NFO, Collective Bargaining System, 
we now have that opportunity. We have had that opportunity. We have used that opportunity in the cotton division. In 1973, 74, 75, 76, and 77, farmers have had the opportunity to contract their cotton at a cost plus a profit. And we will have that opportunity again, working together in 1978 and in the years to come if we block our commodity. Let's go home and get the job done. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. The director of the Sheep Division, Dick Hammond, will now give his report to the convention body. Dick. Well, I got to chicken out a little because last night I promised I'd go get a chair and stand on it and say we might be the littlest, but we're the mightiest. <laughs> I want to thank you folks, and I want to welcome you to my hometown. This is where I was born and raised. This is where I took my training. I said, I want to wel welcome you to Omaha because this is my hometown. Uh, this is where I was trained in marketing and bargaining. And this is an annual event for me. And I just chastised one of the directors here that got up and left because I thought, if I put on a tie, you can at least sit there and listen to what I got to say. In fact, I think I had a lot of courage after last night's dance. This morning, I put a new blade in my razor. <laughs> now, I don't want to give you folks the impression that the sheep division is a bunch of smart alecks or something like that, but we're considering changing the whole division around because coyote pelts now are bringing from two to $400, and they're a heck of a lot worth more than our sheep. <laughs> Some people say and ask, you know, what are you doing in NFO? And I had to really reflect a little. Then I had to say, I want to make a difference. That's what you're doing here. You want to make a difference. <laughs> Just a minute, I have to give Devon his cigarette. <laughs> <laughs> I had two good, I had, you know, very rarely an NFO, and I'm sure you folks have gone through the same thing. Do you ever get any compliments? It's mostly a lot of heck and flack. But I've had two compliments. One, my sheep meeting was full. And I'd all, I, I thought they'd all be down in cattle and grain because the sheep's doing great. <laughs> the second one is when Brunif Gron came up to me and he says, I read your report. And he says, Dick, it was right on. You said it just like it was. And from a gentleman of that kind of standing and understanding of NFO, that was quite a compliment to me. And I really thank him for that. I thank you again because I represent and have the privilege of representing the largest single lamb block in the United States. You just think about that because if you were in my shoes, and had people pay attention to you, let's say, they might not like you too well, but by gosh, they pay attention to you because you represent the largest single land block in the United States, and the only way that I can do that is because you people allowed me to have that obligation and the privilege. My report's going to be short because the sheep division is successful, so we don't have to talk about a lot of problems. We've had them. But I think it's classic this year of the things that really go into marketing and bargaining. We went to California again, as we always have. We got the Mendocino block, and those guys come in, they sign a contract for sale, and, they, and we have a bargaining, mar, uh, 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 a ratification meeting. We, we don't really have a ratification meeting. We have a working meeting when the input from the growers tell me what they want me to do. And I think yesterday I had a, it was left-handed compliments, but I felt really good about it 
because in my meetings, the fellows that represented the different districts from Richard Cook from Colorado and George Davis and Tom Blake, the, the great thing that I heard in that meeting is they said, we told Dick to do that. We told Dick to do that. Dick didn't tell them to do that. And I felt to me that was a successful program because I've got my people or the people that I represent telling me what to do. And basically, we did it. South Dakota, we've increased our volume up there. We're putting new ewes in there. We're putting some breeding ewes in there. But in California, we turned around and put a lamb block together. And we had people tell us when we got through with a professional delivery that said, I hope NFO can organize the whole state of California because we got professional delivery. And, it w and we didn't sell them cheap, so it wasn't a price situation. But they got what they b bargained for, and this was our job. California protected Montana this year, and I can say up there in the, the audience up there, we had a few, <laughs> they did. But, Collective bargaining. Montana got into a little bit of a jam because they got a few more people that said they'll sell that, 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 that really delivered. And California backed them up. That's collective bargaining. But, you know, we've also, uh, we had a tough year. We had a good year, but it was tough because of the fact that we had such buyer resistance from our contracts last year that we, they really resisted us. And you know when you're a bargainer for NFO, and I think now I'm beginning to be, understand a little more, when you're an NFO member, you're pretty special people. And you're gonna get a lot more flack, you're gonna get a lot more attention, you're gonna get a lot more pressure from groups of people or from buyers or whatever because see you're making a difference and when you begin to make a difference that's when the heat starts and we had it this year in Colorado and I'll tell you one thing I thought of a, I, I'm a, a historian and I'll tell you one thing Abe Lincoln was absolutely right a house divided against itself cannot stand and when you're a bargainer and you've got to go out and present a unified front. And you've got people that are working in the, behind you or they haven't got courage enough to make their stand. You're never going to get a price. I don't care how long we work, how much rhetoric you hear from this podium, unless you stand together and you unify and you do it, never. Again, we exemplified the situation in Monta Vista, Colorado. Small collection point made of small people, born out of weakness. We went in this year, and a major packer, and I was told this by a competitor, not by the packer. We went in, offered them a contract, helped work it out for them, and this competitor said, boy, you know, you saved the packing house there, mister. He said they, were, they had a date on that door. And we can't stand to lose competition. We can't stand to have the processors that we so depend upon as far as processing the products that we have. We can't stand them going out of business. So we got to be problem solvers instead of problem makers. Now, I'm the technician. I don't make policy. But I'll tell you one thing, when it comes to going into a packing, packing plant and talking about buying and selling, I know what that guy can stand and I know what he can't stand, and I'm there to see that we get an equitable situation and it be a, 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 of some assistance to him in his business as well so that he can do business at a profit not only as well as we want to do. I think that it's indicative and an eloquent example that I called a major packer and I'm going to stay over the weekend here and go on into South Dakota. I asked him, I said, well, what, 
what do, you, what do we want to do here? What, what kind of a situation? He says, you price the, uh, price the, the lambs. And, you know, he bargained a little while. And then he says, Dick, why don't you just put it together and I'll buy it? How many times have you had that said to you? But it tells me something. It tells me that they know we're powerful, but they also know we're fair. And if we want justice, justice begins right here. As I said, when you're an NFO member or you're an NFO bargainer, it's a different ball game, folks. And I think you better I think you better really recognize this. You know, after 30 years in the business, it's kind of scary that you're still having to learn a few things. In fact, it's a little bit embarrassing to have to stand up here and admit that you don't know everything when I'm supposed to be one of the smartest birds around. But all I can say is that I learned something. When I was, in a, when I was a buyer, there was an undeclared law. It was a fraternity law that says you don't monkey with the other guy's contract. And see, I kind of was naive, I went along. See, now when I make a contract, every buyer wants to get on the action. And when it comes to being an NFO bargainer, it's open season, there's no bag limit, it's 24 hours a day, and it's 365 days a year. So when I go into a contract now, or I go into bargaining, I can't expect the least consideration. We floored the price in Colorado. We fought it out. We had a meeting in Vail, and we tried to enlist another organization to sit down and not enlist them, uh, so it's not against Cap or Volstag, but sit down, we use this organization, and say, Look, we need to sit down, we need to talk about prices on our lambs. But people, this is a real eloquent example. You know what the big concern was? We got to hurry up and get to the banquet and the dance. That's really the truth. We went home with absolutely little or no input for one of the largest sheep operations cheap organizations in the United States because they were too preoccupied with the banquet and the dance. So now you got to recognize that when people have that kind of thinking, you're bound to have a lot of problems. We floored the price in Colorado. In fact, I have to say that in the state of Colorado, this year on an average price, we probably have had the highest in its history. NFO Block did it because we held out and the buyers decide as, as they went around uh, picking off a few of the, on the outlying people, when, when, the, when we, they all sat down and decided let's wait NFO out, what are they going to do? And when we sold that block of lambs, if you ever wanted to see the chickens come out of the coop, uh, that was it. And they ran out and they had to go two, three, four, five cents higher because they couldn't pick up the orders, they couldn't pick up the numbers that they needed for the commitments they had already made. Now I think I've, I have a man in Utah who I think, he's not an NFO member, but he's been an ex-commission man, he owns a, a spread, and if I had to go to somebody in, in this United States in the sheep business, and he's probably in his 60s, I would say that that would be my sage, that would be the man that I would go to and I would ask for advice. I figured it out the other night because he hasn't gone with the NFO program, it's cost him a little over $56,000. We got a great potential. We've got the lowest numbers that we've ever had in the sheep business. We got more people to feed and clothe than we ever had and it's a situation where we're in a position to be able to furnish to you breeding stock, replacement ewes, replacement lambs, you name it, we'll get it for you, if providing we can come up with enough numbers to make it feasible for transportation. We interchange our personnel. We're a small outfit. We interchange our personnel with, the, with feeder cattle, 
fat cattle, whatever it takes, uh, we're there to do it, and they're certainly very helpful to us as well. Sometimes, you know, we think Jesus NFO just hasn't got off the ground. Well, let's kind of keep this in mind. I'm going to read this to you. The wingspan of a Boeing 747 jet is longer than the distance of the first flight of the Wright brothers. So when people call you pioneers, you better believe this is what you've had to go through to get where you are today than when we're ready for it. Sometimes I get depressed. I wonder if you do. You go out, you talk to your neighbors, you pound on a door, a guy says, off the place, or you get put down. But if you folks, some people have to go to the Bible for solace. In NFO, you don't need to go to the Bible. Just go to your history book and study the history of the War of Independence. Find out how General Washington got along at Valley Forge and how he had to beg Congress for enough bucks to, to, to get, pay the bills. And you think about it, you read about it, and you'll feel it because you've gone through it yourself. I thought this was, this, this really was amusing to me. It brought General von Steuben over to train the troops. He's a Prussian general. So he rode out to a very remote courthouse. I, I'm sure you fellows have made a few, and ladies have made a few county meetings in a remote area. And he was supposed to have 500 people there that he was going to train. Well, I'll tell you, five guys showed up and three of them deserted. Now, is that, is that a little familiar? We fought a war that said it was over. When we really get done and we talk about the Revolutionary War or the War of Independence, I have to be careful about revolutionary because it sounds like I'm saber rattling, but it was taxation without representation. What are we doing here? We got one going too. It's pricing without our consent. All I can say to you, Ben Franklin, uh, when John Hancock put his famous signature on the Declaration of Independence, uh, he turned around and he said to Ben Franklin, he says, you know, we've got to hang together in this situation. And old Ben was kind of a wit, and he said, yes, sir, because if we don't, we're all going to hang alone. And all I can say is, I'm ready. Are you? Thank you. I want someone to explain to me how you pronounce the word E-W-E. -E. As I traveled around the country, I heard people calling it yow. And I wondered if there was another breed of livestock out there that I didn't know anything about. And so I'm happy to know that Dick and I understand how to pronounce the word E-W-E, -E, U. Now, we're going to have one more report before we recess for lunch. And that's from the feeder cattle division. Dave Miller, who is the director. Dave. Thank you, Devon. It gives me a great deal of pleasure to be with you again as fellow NFO members and producers at a convention that I feel is going to result in more action than anything that we've done in NFO since I've been a part of it. The cattleman today has continued to operate in a situation where the financial losses are rising. But I know and you know that there's a way to do something about that. We have programs designed to move feeder cattle from the farm or ranch where they're produced to the feedlot or the backgrounder at the very best system and with the least amount of inconvenience and stress on the cattle, expense to the cattlemen that there is in the nation today. And you, NFO members, have built a structure across this nation that is unequal by any other group or any other company in existence today. And I think that it's time that we're proud of that system, that we use that system, 
And during the time that I have been involved with the feeder department since last April, I've seen a tremendous amount of change. We have been very well supported by the membership of this organization. We've seen things happen like members getting together with the employees, directors of the department, and sitting down at the table and discussing the situation that they're in and what we can do to make the program in that area work better. Our contract program in Montana this year was extremely successful. We've opened up new areas across the United States where we're now moving feeder cattle where six months ago, a year ago, no one in those areas knew very much about NFO or what they could do. We have continued to improve our systems in the areas where we have been operating and delivering feeder cattle for a long time, and I'm happy to report to you that those programs are working and that whenever and wherever we as cattlemen get together and block production, put it through the NFO system, that we can have an effect on prices and move ourselves one step closer to that goal of cost of production plus a reasonable profit. I was very much encouraged yesterday in our feeder meetings with the response of the members and the satisfaction that they displayed toward the programs that we have been involved in over this past year. I was also very much enthused by the group of young farmers that we met with last night who I am confident are going to go back to their home areas they're going to organize their fellow farmers and within a very short period of time, I think you'll see a tremendous change across the United States as far as NFO and the organization of farmers and the success that they can display will be seen. We're not going to continue on very long. I know it's about time for your lunch, but I'd just like to say that I'd ask each of you who are at this convention to take a long, hard look at what you can do in your areas to improve the feeder program if that's what you're involved in. I think we all have to look at ourselves and say, now's the time for collective bargaining in agriculture, and now is the time for me to do my part to make this program, the NFO goals, uh, be realized across this country. You can help in many ways, but just remember that we've got a tremendous number of farmers and ranchers in this country that won't be operating over a very much longer period of time unless you and I do our share to keep ourselves and our neighbors in business. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dave. And so let me introduce to you Rene Neese, the Director of Operations for the Grain Department. Rene. Mr. Chairman, delegates, and guests, the National Farmers Organization's Grain Department is broken down into three separate and distinct departments, the first one being Area Office Management, Grain Accounting, and the Grain Department. Area Office Management is responsible for document control and the receipt and disbursement of member information. Grain Accounting is responsible for the collection of funds from the buyer dispersal of those funds to the member through the Minnesota Grain Trust under NFO contract. In, in grain accounting, we have seven grain accounting offices located across the nation. These are indicated by the solid circles on the overhead projector. Starting on the eastern part of the United States, these are Salina, Ohio, Clarksville, Tennessee, Andover, Illinois, Minneapolis, Minnesota, Shawnee Mission, Kansas, Tualatin, Oregon, Hanford, California. 
We also have 14 area management offices which are indicated by the STARS and two satellite offices across the nation. The third department, the grain department, is responsible for blocking a production and assisting the member in the delivery of that grain to the buyer. We have 25 area grain directors across the country in all the major grain producing areas. Starting on the eastern part of the United States, these include Warren Marsh, who is responsible for the Trenton, Tappahannock, and Wilson marketing areas, which include the states of eastern Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Delaware, Maryland, Virginia, and North Carolina. Going all the way across to the western part of the United States, which includes Ron Mattis, who is responsible for the Chico, the Fresno, and the Klamath marketing areas in the states of California and southern Oregon. Grain movement on a daily basis through the program includes shipments by truck, rail, and barge. We have barge loading points in all the major U.S. navigable river systems in this country. These include the Cumberland, the Ohio, the Mississippi, the Illinois, the Missouri, and the Arkansas River systems as indicated on this transparency. We also have two other barge loading facilities. One is on the eastern part of the United States on the Chesapeake Bay at Salisbury, Maryland, and the other one is in the western part of the United States at Lewiston, Idaho on the Snake River. You see here indicated by both the stars and the solid circles, NFO member accumulation points and throughput facilities in excess of 60 in number that are currently under signed agreement that our members have available to ship production through. We also have over 100 trackside loading points and other throughput facilities that are, av are available to our members to ship grain through when necessary. Participation in the grain program starts with signing their production up on a grain contract for sale. A member can commit 100% of his production on two crop years on one document. He can start off by signing part of that production in section one, which is saying to us, let's put blocks together or move my production immediately, which can be indicated by checking the immediate sale block, but let's start bargaining and raising the general price level. The balance of his production committed in section two means that that grain is available to go through the program at a future date, but he retains the right to make the decision either verbally or in writing to us when he's ready to move either part or all of that production in section two. We also have an acres block where a member can commit 100% of his new crop acres for the coming years in section two, and he is only responsible for delivering the production that is harvested from those acres. Thank you. As we began to put together a staff in the grain department, we felt the need of people who had experience and became experienced to the point in their fields that they could provide a great service for the organization. We went out to look around to see who was available and found there wasn't very many available, so the only alternative was to pirate from the major corporations those whom we needed. And this is what we done. We contacted these people and explained to them our programs and purposes, and because of their interest, they became involved in NFO and, in more particular, in the grain program. One of these men is that of Fred Olson, and we'll let Fred now uh, go through his program and perhaps tell you a little about his own background. A uh, note that I've received is we're getting several requests from people in the audience to those who are smoking to be kind enough not to within the arena of the uh, building. Thank you. Fred. Thank you, Mr. Willen. For a brief background of myself, I was born and raised in the grain business. My father was a grainman in a small town in North Dakota. But I have been connected with the grain business on a whole time basis since 1937. That uh, gives me slightly over 40 years. And uh, during that period of time, I worked for a major cooperative for over 20 years and one of the larger corporations for 15 years prior to coming with the NFO. When Mr. Staley asked me to join him in the NFO, I decided that 
the last few years of my life should be, a working life, should be dedicated to helping the farmer. I was raised among them, I worked for them for all those years, gained a lot of knowledge in corporate structure while with a large grain and processing firm. Incidentally, that processing firm are very good friends of the NFO, and we do a lot of trading with them. I am going to speak to you today basically on, on the export end of our, of our operation. I don't know if you know it, but we export nearly 25% of all the corn that you produce. We export nearly half of all the beans you produce, either in the form of the beans or their products. We export just about half of all the wheat that's produced. So you see, and we recognize this, and we decided about two years ago to enter into the export field. Now, you just don't walk into the export field overnight. It takes a system of supplying the ports, such as Rainey pointed out that we have in our capabilities of making shipments and our rail transportation had to be supplemented by fleet cars, lease cars. Now, I'd like to briefly tell you what we consider the export markets. They are basically the European, which includes the European Economic Community. We had a representative of that community at our Tuesday meeting. I wish you all could have heard him. Uh, in, also in Europe, we have the East European countries, including Russia, Poland, East Germany. Also in, the, in that theater, we must consider the Mediterranean, which includes Italy, uh, the North Africa, and the Near East countries. Now, the next major outlet for grain export-wise is in the Far East. The major buyer and the single largest customer that the United States has is Japan. Also included in that theater is Korea, Taiwan, several Southeast Asia countries, and at some times, Red China. Red China is somewhat reluctant to buy from us for political reasons, that is, that we recognize Taiwan. The third, not quite as important as far as our outlets are concerned, but certainly important as uh, a major outlet, is South American countries. <clears throat> Most of these are located in the northern part of South America, but also Peru and Chile. Now, each of these locations or destinations must be served by po different ports throughout the United States. These major ports are located like this. First of all, up in the north, we have the Great Lakes system. That includes Duluth Superior, Chicago, some Milwaukee shipments, and Toledo. From that port, much of the grain is shipped to up the St. Lawrence River, where it's unloaded and reshipped in the form of topping off vessels or loading ocean vessels direct out of those ports. We have what we call the North Atlantic ports. That is all along the East Coast. Major ones are such as Philadelphia, Baltimore, and Norfolk. We have the Louisiana Gulf ports, which is by far the largest of all our shipping ports. That includes uh, about seven or eight uh, facilities there at the port. They're high volume terminals that ship uh, at least 10 million bushels each every month. When we go over to the uh, Texas Gulf, you would have ports at Houston, Galveston, Corpus Christi. On the West Coast, we have ports at Pacific Northwest, which would include Seattle, Tacoma, Vancouver, Washington, and Portland, Oregon. Going further south, you have what we call the Pacific South Coast, anything from San Francisco down to Long Beach, uh, uh, California. Now, of these ports, are served by different modes of transportation. That is, the inbound grain at the Great Lakes, for instance, comes in basically by truck and rail. A large amount of truck grain does enter the, uh, come into these ports. In the North Atlantic ports, it's practically all rail. The Gulf Coast is basically uh, barge, the largest percentage, and some rail. Texas Gulf is rail and truck. The West Coast is 
basically a rail, but also some barge off the Snake and Columbia River system and some trucks. As I mentioned about two years ago, we very seriously looked into getting into the direct export business as well as the indirect business, to which we are very heavily engaged. The direct export meant that we must have customers overseas so we could make shipment delivered to their ports of call or sold to them on an FOB buyer's vessel. So we put together blocks of grain, which we offered to overseas buyers. We put one block together going out of the Pacific Northwest, one out of Texas Gulf, one out of New Orleans. And the one out of New Orleans first shipment was a shipload of beans, soybeans. We loaded that, and about two weeks later, Mr. Staley and myself followed the movement over to Rotterdam, Holland. We met the vessel in the port, viewed it, and found the quality to be in good shape. We uh, had meetings with many of the top officials of all their uh, different type industry interests, such as the feed manufacturers, the processors of the beans, the port facility people. And I must say that they kept us hopping all the time we were there, just in one meeting after the other and viewing. We toured part of Holland, looking at their feed operations, even their uh, experimental livestock operations. We even toured one of the farms. Incidentally, uh, their farms are considerably smaller than ours. The one we, were, we viewed was 250 acres and was worth about $1 million. So uh, their land is very valuable, and it, but it was good, nice land below sea level with dikes on all sides. Uh, we followed that trip. Uh, from there, we went from Holland, we went on over to London and attended uh, a banquet, convention-type banquet, which was uh, being held by GAFTA. That's the Grain and Feed Trade Association. Now, that included top officials from all the industry people throughout the world. We made many, many acquaintances and associations through that meeting alone. We met many people that I had known in, in, back in the grain industry uh, while we were at that convention. We followed that trip to Europe up for another trip over six months later, had prearranged meetings with all the top people in Belgium and Germany. We went from Belgium to about four cities in Germany, and we even touched uh, East Berlin and met with the top officials of their agriculture department, government agriculture department. We hope that that someday will lead to doing business in that area. Now, there's somewhat of a difference in doing business on an export basis, whether it be direct or indirect, but definitely on a direct basis. First of all, your blocks must be much larger. We feel that you should not enter a market with less than 10,000 metric tons at any one time in order to get the clout you need to do the bargaining. It also is the minimum requirements for shipments on ocean-going vessels, as those holes will take, one hold will take at least 5,000 and quite often 10,000. We consider a 35,000 ton ship to be the minimum size in order to keep your freight costs down. Any, lower, any smaller than that, your shipments will cost you more money on ocean freight. It's much better to even have them up into the 50, 60,000 ton class. Another thing that is quite different, in order to keep abreast and to keep the best markets available to you, you must sell on a forward position. An importer of feed grains or soybeans does not wait until Thursday to cover his Friday needs. He buys at least three months ahead, and quite often even eight, nine months ahead, and sometimes as far as a year. So we must offer and make sales for these deferred positions, as we find that offering for nearby positions, the markets are already covered, unless there's somebody that is 
short the market, has sold it, and has not bought it in. That is the international traders. And they do that quite often. But anyway, I want to point out and make it clear to you that we are still small in the export business, but we can grow. We'll grow just as fast as you put the grain to us. We have the capabilities. We have associations that permit us now to uh, have Rotterdam on the phone, finding out what the markets are. It's a matter of picking up the phone and having me on, on the other end within minutes. We do this frequently. And even if we aren't making a trade, it keeps us informed as to what's going on so we know that the prices we're receiving in this country on a domestic basis are in line with the world markets. But please get more grain behind the export trade. We don't know. The one thing you can do, you can predict your domestic consumption very closely, but not the export business. That can vary with your ability to move it on to what they want. And I must say that after all of our entering into the export market, we have had literally hundreds of, of contacts from people all over the world trying to buy grain direct from us. Our capabilities aren't that great that we can accommodate very many of them. But as we, if you can get more grain behind the blocks for this export business, we can handle it for you and get it on to the final destination. Thank you very much. Please turn your tape over to the second side for continuation of the speeches. And we went after the best man that we could find in the name of Carl Buckheit. And so we'll now have Carl give his report to the convention. Carl? Thank you, Mr. Woodland. I will confine my brief remarks to the importance and the need for transportation expertise. My transportation experience dates back to 1935, approximately 43 years. Some of these years, the early part of them, were spent in the East at Buffalo, New York, and at Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Subsequent to this, I moved to the central part of the United States, spending a few years in central Illinois, and ultimately moved to St. Louis. My duties while in St. Louis included supervision of the transportation function of facilities located in the states of Nebraska, Kansas, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Missouri, Tennessee, North Carolina, just to name a few. Accordingly, I am proud to dedicate this expertise to contributing to the cost of production plus a reasonable profit. Transportation can affect the cost of production because transportation means a direct cost to you, but transportation can more contribute to the reasonable profit part of the precept by guaranteeing you the, freight, the correct freight rate and cost on your sale to the best market. The bargainers are constantly advised of the best market based <clears throat> on the least transportation cost. A large percentage of the tremendous volume of grain can't be used in the producing area, so it must move to the consuming area. And move is a key word because transportation is most important. During the commodity meetings, I pointed out that the country is divided into approximately nine distinct rail jurisdiction or territories. This means that the rail structures are at different levels and different conditions. It's the function of the Transportation Department to be knowledgeable of all the rates and transportation characteristics within and between these different rate territories. Since October 1973, your rail transportation costs have been increased by 10 different rate increases. And accordingly, your costs have gone up 49.6% to 61.6% 
depending upon what your origin and or your destination is. Now, on November 30th, a new 5% increase went into effect. Incidentally, on behalf of the National Farmers Organization, I wrote all the major rate jurisdictions and also the Interstate Commerce Commission and was among 263 objectors to this rate proposal, but the Commission saw fit to grant the carriers this increase. Now, you might think, well, 5% increase is going to be an across-the-board increase, but the ink was hardly dry on the tariff permitting this increase when they made an, uh, an exception which granted corn and corn only moving on a particular tariff rate from the states of Minnesota, Ohio, Illinois, Indiana, into Maine, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Vermont, Rhode Island, and Connecticut. That was brought about by the fact that apparently the interests in, that st in those states convinced the Commission that they only needed a 3% increase to move corn alone into New England. However, you could load a car of corn from one location to one destination in New England and pay 5% increase, but if you load a car of wheat from that same location on that same date to the same destination, your in rate rate, freight rate is going to be increased 5%. That indicates just briefly a little bit of the complexities that are involved in properly monitoring the transportation costs. Uh, another thing that the rail carriers uh, inflicted upon us was a 20 percent increase on the freight rates within and between the Southern Territory of 20 percent, and that is effective only from September 15th to December 15th, and that's brought about by their alleged need for more income down there and to better utilize their cars. Here again, this was objected to, but uh, it was granted, so it's, it's really important that we have this knowledge to keep abreast of the rate situation. Because the buyers, the buyers of your grain, are not too much interested in what the proper and correct transportation rate is. They'll pay to the rail carrier whatever they are billed. They'll do that because they know when they make their final accounting for the grain, they're going to charge the NFO and ultimately you, the member, what they paid. Therefore, it is necessary that we monitor these freight rates, and we have recovered many, many thousands of dollars in incorrect freight charges that were assessed against you. Another function is to monitor the rate proposals, to compare the rates that we are paying for our, from our various loading points and facilities to see that they are compatible and equitable and competitive with rates from nearby competing origins. Basically, I think you might say that I am the watchdog of your transportation dollars. I am happy to have had this opportunity to let you see me so you'll know who to contact to assist you in your grain transportation needs. Thank you. The next is Jack Armstrong. I know that Devon has told you the background of the other people that are assisting you. Jack Armstrong, John Armstrong, we always refer to him as Jack Armstrong, the old American boy. Can't get away from it and introduce him. But nevertheless, he has added tremendous additional expertise and support to the organization and enthusiasm, but know-how. 
There's no question but what he knows the markets in the Midwest area and the, of uh, many states as well or better than anybody in this country. This time, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Jack Armstrong. Thank you, Mr. President. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to discuss with you briefly your domestic markets, the way you affect them through bargaining, and some of the methods that we use in choosing various buyers throughout this country. It is indeed a pleasure to be here and see so many states represented, so many people here today, and be able to talk to you. As you all know, we have a situation now that's very depressing in trying to produce grain and trying to bargain for this grain at a fair market price to enable you to continue to produce year in and year out. By utilizing your production and moving it in the proper direction, we are able, as an organization, not as individuals, to move a market and to change the situation. Through your efforts and your commitment 100 percent, we can take and start at the local level and move to your mill markets in your domestic areas and or to a golf market and consequently raise your local prices. We choose buyers for the same reason. The buyers being millers in one case that need a continuous supply of grain. We try to feed that market as long as it's advantageous to you as members. And in turn, we utilize the other markets that are available at the Gulf and also relate those markets to your foreign buyers to make sure that we have a fair price in the market pattern at all times. The buyers that we normally choose in the export market are the ones that move the grain direct out of the country through our various ports, as you heard previously. With the expertise that we have in transportation and the knowledge of our foreign buyers, we are able, with your help, to get you a better price and stair-step your market up. So I hope in the future that we can commit ourselves 100 percent and stair-step this market up so you will have a fair price for your production. Thank you. Next, we'll go to the report to the Convention on the Fat Cattle Division, Slaughter Division. We made many changes in the last few months and divided up the territory and the responsibilities. And the uh, man that we sought, uh, the Midwest was somebody that had been a manager of a slaughter plant, cattle kill. Somebody had been a head cattle buyer, head of the head cattle buyer for somebody and at least uh, new feedlot operations. We found, uh, in searching for the man, that the name of Walt Hackney came up more than anybody else. And so we contacted him and was able to secure his services in one that I think uh, is really meeting the challenge, and the one that many of you already have seen his ability show, Walt Hackney, uh, the charge of the areas from the Canadian line to the Gulf of Mexico, and covering the states and some additional duties besides, but uh, from the Dakotas, Nebraska, Kansas, uh, on down from that side over to Illinois, on the east and on down through Arkansas and Texas, covering Wisconsin also, so in all the states in between. So at this time, it gives me great pleasure to present to you Walt Hackney. Thank you, Orrin Lee. 
As a recent newcomer to the National Farmer Organization and having come from the packing industry, I personally consider it a real honor and a privilege to be able to speak here this afternoon at the convention. Before I go into the slaughter cattle segment, I would like to just say one thing. Yesterday afternoon, Gene Potter came to our cattle meeting that we were conducting here and asked me if I would drop down and attend a meeting around 5 o'clock that he was conducting in a lower level of this building. And I got down there and I looked around at that crowd and it made me to reflect just a little bit because we seem to be in an age of giving discredit to the young people of America because of the drugs and other kinds of degener degeneration that seem to be being applied to our young people. Well, I saw in that meeting of young National Farmer Organization farmers another kind of high among the young people of our country. I saw a group of young men and young women that were on a trip for rural America. And it looked obvious to me, probably as an outsider to this organization, that it was our obligation, it was our duty professionally to supply the leadership that they obviously were here seeking. And I think it's the duty of every man and woman in this organization to be sure that they get that kind of leadership. I only wanted to say that because I noticed it I've seen it the last few weeks in Corning, Iowa, and I felt like this may be a time to emphasize that. In the slaughter cattle department, we have two or three prime objectives in mind. When I came here, you had a structure that was originated when this organization originated, and that was your Minuteman structure. The paralysis of that structure became evident when you started to have to rely on voluntary labor. You had men and women in the various communities that simply could not supply the necessary time to train themselves properly, have the professional attitude in a country to properly describe cattle, to accurately describe these cattle into packers, and consequently, you could not maintain a rapport with those packers. Consequently, because of the lack of rapport you had, you developed an enmity to them, and because of that, your volume fell off. There's only one way that you can effectively bargain, and that's with volume. With volume, you still have to maintain a consistency of supply and quality to the respective packers. You have to give a packer what he is and can sell. Every packer has got a specified market. They're specialized to the extent now that they cannot take out-of-kind cattle without giving you as a producer a dif discount on them. It's my obligation to this organization to supply the necessary knowledge I have of the respective packers in the Midwestern area of the United States to know what those packers demand, what their sales are developed for, and to be able to effectively encourage you as the National Farmer Organization to block your product, collectively put it together in a consistency of supply, and let me then merchandise it for you in volume to those respective packers. We're emphasizing professionalism because it's the only way that we can adequately describe these cattle. You've done your best, as, as best you could, to develop the program. But as a packer, I can tell you, you were easy to knock off simply because of your voluntary labor. We could put people out there on a salaried professional basis and in some cases hired your membership to spot cattle for us for a buck a head and got by with it. And it was an easy program to break down. However, I am armed with enough knowledge of how we could break that organization down that I think on the same side now I can help reorganize that and move the product. Now what we're doing is going into these respective areas with supervisors that are trained and professional in their field. We are then going into the respective counties of these areas and we are asking and getting the leadership that we need to accurately describe cattle to those supervisors. 
we will not and do not rely on the voluntary labor. I would appreciate it. It's extremely welcome. But I can assure you that if I don't get the cooperation from the membership, I'll go on the outside and get people that are willing to work for us. And I am and have been doing that in other areas. I emphasize that after this meeting is over, any of the young men or anyone else in this room that feel like they could or would be willing to have the qualification to properly go into the counties and describe these cattle for our supervisors in order to develop this volume, I would ask you to come by our slaughter cattle booth over here and sit down with us and visit briefly. We've got supervisors in there that will be willing to either give you the qualification test or else send them home with you and let you bring them back to us. Now in our program, our emphasis has been on volume and I can assure you that in the short three months I've been here, we have seen a significant response in that volume. It has been significant enough that we've got packers coming to us now where in the past we've had to go to them primarily with our hat in our hand and they are coming to us and asking for our business. They are wanting the National Farmer Organization business because they can see the impact that volume movement out of the respective counties is having on their ability to personally go out one-on-one -on -one with you as a group and buy from you. They've found that collectively we're a tougher bunch to get along with and that they want our business. We've got the largest heifer killer in the United States personally came into our Tuesday meeting and made an appeal to us as an organization to help him. This man was one that absolutely never wanted our business, still doesn't have a contract, but when he walked out of that meeting, he said, Walt Hackney, when you get done this week, call me. I'd like to discuss the National Farmer Organization cattle program. Now, what we need to do is cooperate. We need to participate in this slaughter cattle program. We have got excellent people involved. You've got the professionalism that you've needed over at the Corning office now to effectively block and merchandise your livestock for you. We've got some inequities that we're currently overcoming, but I can assure you the pluses now far outweigh any minuses that that uh, department has. And with that, I just simply want to say it is an honor. It's a privilege for a person like myself that has fought this organization for years and I've seen the result of that. I saw that activity break a family, mine personally in the Oklahoma panhandle. I saw that one-on-one -on -one concept break personal friends of mine when I put my men one-on-one -on -one with them. I grew tired of that. I grew tired enough that I wanted to seek another source to try to put my talent or professionalism to work. When Orrin Lee Staley called me in Omaha when I was here in the stockyards about three months ago, I thought it was a joke. And when I went home and told my wife about it, she didn't. She said, I think this is possibly what you've been searching for for three or four years. And I considered it and I called Orrin Lee. I told he and Gene Potter I'd like to belong to this organization. And I can tell you it's been extremely gratifying. Thank you. Next, we're very fortunate to have a man who has experience in the slaughter cattle end of the production. He also has a lot of ranch experience and care of, of uh, cattle. He was associated with Fat City, the largest uh, feedlot in the United States at the time. And so we have a man who has experience who's leading, giving the leadership and the know-how to 11 states in the West, Pacific Northwest, covering from Montana on through uh, to Oregon, Washington, and down through California, Arizona, and back through Colorado, New Mexico, and all the states in between. So at this time, it gives me great pleasure to present to you Pete Hughes in charge of that area. Pete. Thank you, Orrin Lee. It's a great pleasure for me to be here, and it's an honor to address 
this convention, and you as NFO members. I came back to Corning, Iowa approximately nine months ago. I was a little bit concerned when I did come back because I felt and I have had observed NFO for a number of years before coming back to Corning. I had observed the high quality of your feeders, the high quality of your grain, your feed grains. I had observed a lot of professionalism that existed within the organization. I could not understand the lack of participation. One of the things that I have tried to develop in the 11 Western states was a source of volume. We can talk about collective bargaining till we're blue in the face, but if all you have is one cancer ride cow, you're not going to have collective bargaining. What do you do to get volume? First of all, you have to develop programs that are viable. I could have a list of credentials as long as this podium. It wouldn't mean anything to any one of you. But one of the things that will mean something to you is performance. In the last eight months, we have signed 31 new feedlots in the 11 western states. These feedlots range in size from 200 head to 30,000 head. Now what does this mean to you as an organization? A 30 to 35,000 head feedlot and a man that puts his name on a membership agreement and I'm extremely blunt about this. I don't ask them for their production. I demand their production. A person that puts his name on this agreement that feeds 30,000 head of cattle, he is entrusting NFO with approximately $36 million. I think NFO as an organization, when we can sign these type of people into the organization speaks extremely high of NFO. When we sign large volume producers like this, and in the 11 western states it's a lot different than it is here in the Midwest, in this respect is that the concentration of cattle is in a very limited number of people the high concentration, the large lots. We need these people. And a very curious thing has happened in the last six months. Three years ago, a 30,000 head feedlot didn't think he needed any form of collective bargaining. He didn't think that he needed any organization because he felt that he was professional enough and big enough to handle it alone. These people today realize that they are not individually large enough. They also realize that even if they had all of the cattle in one state, that wasn't enough. But they do appreciate the system that NFO has coast to coast. They are realizing this is the only answer. The strength in blocks, in production. We talk about 30 percent, and this is probably one of the most gratifying things that's happened to me since I joined NFO. In eastern Colorado last week, we signed an additional two feedlots. NFO in the eastern half, southeastern part of Colorado, now has approximately 125,000 head of fat cattle under membership agreement and in members' hands. And in the southeastern part of Colorado, 
that represents 30 percent of the cattle in that area. Here at this convention, to tell you exactly how serious Walt Hackney, myself, and Bill Selhorst are as far as professionalism in this program, there was no way in the world that we were going to come to this convention and not have our office right here. You as members and producers are extremely important to us. We can't go away and forget you for a week. We cannot forget your cattle. That is why you see it is business as usual out in our booth, and it has been all week. We want to take care of you. This is our obligation to you. You are putting your lifeblood in our hands, and if we are not professional enough to take care of you, then we do not deserve to have that responsibility. Here at this convention, I have received several calls. The convention has had extremely good coverage in the press across the country, in Idaho, and in California. I have received an invitation to visit a feedlot which numbers approximately 40,000 head. Believe me, people, when individuals and feedlots like this have the confidence in NFO, and NFO has developed this type of image, we are well on the way to a true collective bargaining organization. Thank you very much. Next, I want to introduce a man that I've known a long time and has been with us and has done so much work in organizing. And I said to him one day, I said, Bill, you know, if we don't get something done and delegate out the responsibility in that slaughter cattle division, you're the one that's going to get slaughtered. We're going to be putting dirt on you some of these days. And I think you've seen a relaxed Bill Sellhorse, but a driving Bill Sellhorse that I want to present to you right now that's had a lot of help now and is very appreciative of it. Ladies and gentlemen, what Orrin Lee is saying is right. A year ago about now, I went to the hospital with the awfulest case ulcers that any man ever had, and we were wondering if we could ever cure them. It was shortly after that that Pete Hughey joined us. I was still living on Maylox in this summer, and on into fall, Walt came, and Virgil, of course, was always there. And believe it or not, as I'm standing before you today, I haven't used Maylox for 30 days. I feel like a million dollars and could whip half the world. But let me say this in all sincerity. It is an absolute feeling of confidence when you're able to attract the type of people that Walt, Pete, Virgil, Sam Kearns, who's out in the country, isn't here today, and many others that I could name. Just among Walt, Pete, and Virgil, there are 72 years of livestock experience in the critical area of livestock experience in the marketing and bargaining end. That can't be ignored. Obviously, and as many of you have said many times, and all of us well know, it's performance that gets results. It isn't philosophy, not anymore at least, and it isn't good intentions, it's absolute performance. And that's what it's all about. Pete so ably put it, your lifeblood is in our hands when you commit your cattle. It's up to us then to perform as you would expect us to perform, and as many instances even better than you would expect. As you well know, or some of you may maybe don't know, we talk about 30% of this nation's production going through the NFO program, purely confident that, it, that that figure is highly adequate to establish the price for everyone. What does it represent by way of slaughter cattle? We slaughter approximately 145,000 cattle a day, ladies and gentlemen. 30% of those are 43,500 cattle a day that we fully intend will be moving through the NFO program. 
That's really not all such a big figure when you consider there are 2,000 cattle counties in this United States, so translated to understandable figures, it's 22 head of cattle per county per day. Now we are in the process of finding, training, the type of people that can operate on a county level to communicate with you to put that volume together. And ladies and gentlemen, I dare say, with a reasonable amount of training, with good backup operations, which we have, there are very few of you in this room today that could not go out in your counties and actively solicit 22 head of cattle a day. That's only 110 a week. We've got a fair amount of people right now already doing that. Darrell Holly is somewhere in this room today. He's already doing that. Leonard Christian is already doing that. Melvin Meister is already doing that. And I could go on and on and on. Those are just a few that I can happen to think of. So when you think about it, the restructuring process that we're going through generally dictates that each of those people who are responsible for their areas are highly qualified, it's their job, they're expected to get results. It's not necessary for myself to bird dog them because they're the type of people that by their very nature will get results. Their pride dictates that they'll get results because each and every one of them is an absolute winner. And that's what it's all about. So ladies and gentlemen, let me say this. There isn't a doubt in my mind that 1978 will be the year that the American cattle producer comes into his own. It's going to be the year that the American cattle producer will have established collective bargaining nationwide, make it stick. That's not something I'm pulling off the top of my hat. That is something that has been carefully thought out, carefully calculated, with all the procedures put into effect to make it happen. You've all heard many times, we need you to help. That will never change. I don't have to tell it to you again. Your very presence here, you know you have to help. I don't have to tell it to you. But you'll want to more help as the program builds even greater. And ladies and gentlemen, I, I want to say this from the bottom of my heart. This is still the finest group of people in the world you can't go anywhere and find them any better. Yesterday and last night was a pure demonstration of that. Uh, I don't know how to say thanks to all of you for the opportunity you've given me. And people, by golly, let's just do it upright. Thanks a lot. One of the real dedicated NFO workers who heads up the ladies' division and it gives me great pleasure to introduce to a very ins inspiring and dedicated person who really, truly is all NFO through and through. And that's Doris McElwain at this time to talk about what you ladies should help do. Doris? I've been to every national convention since 1965, and this, is the, this was the quietest holding action vote I ever saw. <laughs> I don't know if we should be proud that this is a mark of maturity or the way we should be a little bit scared about the fire simmering a little. Anyway, collective bargaining for agriculture, the idea whose time has come, is what we've been talking about these days at the 77 convention. And as it draws to a close, we should be flying pretty high in our spirits. Folks, this is the precious moment that we all have worked and sacrificed for. This is that inevitable moment in history that NFO members knew would come. Not if, but when. Because we were not getting cost of production prices, and this time of desperate need had to come. But our prayers have been answered because NFO is ready. We have our best chance ahead of us right now. It will take commitment and effort from America's men and women on the land, but we can do it. 
And uh, have you heard that farm and ranch women are half of the human resources in agriculture today? <laughs> Since NFO is different, women's involvement in it is also different. Technical differences are that other farm organizations fall into two categories, legislative and service. NFO is the only nationwide collective bargaining organization. But there are attitude differences too. Other farm organizations seem to belong to the men. And to be darn sure you don't miss the point, they generally set up an auxiliary for us. NFO does not. NFO has not only accepted, but has encouraged women to be full members from the very beginning. NFO is an equal involvement organization. Seemingly, this is not as widely understood as we would hope for. There have been articles that have questioned why farm women are not as accepted in farm organizations. Evidently, they haven't heard about our, ours. This then is the image of farm organizations and it rubs off on NFO if we don't make the effort to make our differences known. We have had a woman on the National Board of Directors duly elected from the membership. No other farm organization can say that. But let's say right here, we are not talking about women's lib. We are talking about farmers and ranchers lib. If we are married to farmers and ranchers, we are too. Our lives and livelihood are not separable. NFO has had women putting their shoulder to the wheel since the beginning. We have never been excluded. We as NFO women have been privileged to be in a position to help make a difference. To affect farm prices, you have to work with production, and farm and ranch women work with it every day. Edmund Burke said in the 1750s that all that is necessary for evil to succeed is for good men and women to do nothing. But how much of an asset we can be, I think, is going to be reflected in how much the husbands want them to be. So now you fellows are going to, I'm really talking to you as much as I am the women. Most women want their husband's approval to do something different, and NFO is different. Mine encouraged me, or I would still be a farmer's uh, wife, a member's wife, and not an NFO member as such. And I'll guarantee you, I consider myself a full-fledged NFO member. It is the difference then that we're talking about between being a wife and being a member. NFO women have full partnership in the farm and ranch operation and also in the NFO membership agreement. We have full membership. That means we can participate in meetings. We can vote on issues. One vote per membership, of, of course, in the commodities. And we'd be voting delegates like right here today. All of this is possible. The only requirement is to be duly elected from the membership. That means then that we have full responsibility as equals in the NFO effort. We farm and ranch gals are underpaid because we are in agriculture. Our family's quality of life depends on success of attaining cost of production plus a fair profit. In NFO, we don't have to be spectators. We are, in fact, as I said earlier, half of the human resources in agriculture. And this is where crass economics and onward Christian soldiers come to a meeting place. Our cause is moral and just. I believe that NFO women must be a part of NFO for it to be successful. Wives being supportive in the attitude for the men is very, very important. Men who have gone down the road for NFO have had a wife and family at home who understood, agreed with, and reinforced his commitment to NFO, or he couldn't have weathered the problems and pressures that this kind of work has put upon them. Good, stable members usually have wives who uphold their NFO beliefs. And by the same token, usually lukewarm or inactive members, their wives generally are not a part of NFO. So let's start the new members out, the ones we're going after this year. Let's start them out on the right foot. Both husbands and wives should be invited to the meetings and to the activities. We can be training two leaders instead of one. 
If we don't, then she will feel like an outsider. Perhaps some of our older members have their wives in a position of feeling like an outsider too. Stop and think about it. She will resist the changes that NFO asks members to make with breaking with the old system if she doesn't understand it. And she will resent the time and effort necessary to build NFO if she doesn't understand it and feel part of it. So let's help her feel like a member, not an accessory. So the first step then I think is up to the men. You fellows who brought your wives along to the convention have not got the handicap that the other boys do when they go home. They're gonna have to try to recount for five days of what happened. <laughs> Had she been here, you see, you could have discussed this on through the winter and no two people hear the same thing, you know. She would have heard some, you would have heard some, and you could have discussed it, and you would have been richer for it. Okay, then approach her about NFO the way you do when you want her, to, want her understanding on other things. Ask her to come to the meetings. Encourage her to participate in the women's activity committees in the counties. There is important county work to be done there. And I usually follow this by saying housework is not noticed unless it's not done. <laughs> and we want our NFO housework to be well done. This would have to be then a family effort, a family priority. So I would like for you to do, two th do one thing when you go home for yourself and your families. Make two lists. One list, l list all of the reasons why you and your wife cannot be fully uh, active in the NFO right now. Be sure to put your kids on there. And then on the other list, list all of the reasons why NFO should come into top priority for your family. And be sure that you put the kids on that one too. Then decide, which list would you like to defend to your conscience and your children when the outcome in agriculture has been determined? Now is the time to affect that outcome. The 1977 convention has been a good place to start, and the 1978 county meetings are a good place to continue. Let's get with it. Thank you.